Good morning. This is Meg Riley, and you've joined us for another episode of The View. I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Michael Tino has been felled by the flu bug this week. He put a little sad gif on Facebook of a little boat going down in a bathtub, and I presume that's exactly how he felt. Uh, <laughs> Christina Rivera has some problems in her house that maybe she'll get fix it people on in time to join us for a while. Maybe she won't. And, but Asia Hauser heroically roused herself on the West Coast despite a headache. Good morning, Asia. I'm so sorry about your headache. Oh, you're so sweet. Good morning from Seattle. Uh, this is Asia Hauser. So apparently I discovered I was waking up with just a headache on my um, uh, right side. And thankfully, uh, one of the our board members at the church is a doctor, and I sat next to him on Tuesday night, and I said, hey, I might have a brain tumor. He said, no, you're grinding your teeth from stress, and surprised you haven't had it the entire time you're working here. So <laughs> thankfully, he told me I put a cold compress on my jaw, and it helped, but I didn't do it last night. Anyway, so it's just a tension headache. I was just, it's, it's like 4 a.m. here. I'm only exaggerating a little bit. Um, so that's me. <laughs> Jessica, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there. West Coast early. You can hear it in my throat. But um, yeah. Jessica, I am, anything going on in your life this week? <clears throat> I'm getting ordained on Saturday. Yay! <laughs> yes, it's very exciting. <clears throat> Who's um, doing the charge to the minister? <laughs> Me, Asia. me, me, I'm doing it, I'm so excited, me, yay. That's kind of radical to have a DRE do the charge to the minister. What's up with that? That's that's just how I roll, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. I feel like um, there are so many wise people that I have learned from on my path through ministry and I'll try not to get choked up, but Asia is definitely one of the people who has been one of my teachers. And I just wanted to acknowledge that in a way that felt real and honest and, you know, that's so going to make me cry. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yep. Well, I love We're that honored. it's part of collaborative leadership that we've been talking about and modeling here on the view. So a relationship forged, in Zoom. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I know we've met we've met once in person, right? Is that right? At GA and I We think met at GA and it was so great because I walked up to her. I'm like, you're so tall. She goes, You're so short. <laughs> it was beautiful. GA is it full was. of surprises. It was. Well, I'm excited to say we have a double header show today. We have them under the title Shut It Down. One of the shutdowns we're happy about, one of the shutdowns we're not happy about. So we're going to start with the shutdown we're not happy about, and that's the government shutdown. And we have Keith Stegall. I hope I said that right. Did I say that right? It's pretty close. Pretty close? What would be right? Stegall. Stegall. That's not close at all. Okay. I am, I am by the way, known for like butchering names, so join, join a long, sad list. Um, Keith Stegall is here and Keith is the facility manager for the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, a unit of the National Park Service, um, a place many of us have been and love. And so Keith, you've been not showing up for work for how long now? Well, the entire shutdown. Uh, I, technically, uh, because of my position, um, I have, I'm, I would call, I'm what's called sort of a part-time point of contact. Um, and, and actually this weekend I'll be taking over uh, on the weekends duty shift just to, to be that point of contact. They'll be on phone calls with the regional office and uh, be that point of contact for our volunteers and partners. So is the regional office open then? No, uh, oh. but there are certain members, just like in the parks, there are certain people designated in the regional office to be uh, essential employees. And uh, the, most people... Uh, that are that are deemed essential are probably working eight hour shifts uh, in our case uh, because we don't we only have 10 paid employees technically at the park uh, we're only working just, just flag that that's 10 people with the whole Appalachian Trail yeah Georgia to Maine 13 states yeah 10 people are, are, are already wild our, our park manages in what's called a, a cooperative management system so the the 10 paid staff work 
with uh, uh, through the 13 states, we have uh, 31 trail clubs that sort of act like an adopt highway program, if you will, up and down the trail. And then we have our major park partner that we work very closely with uh, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, otherwise known as ATC. So can those groups continue working with the shutdown? No, uh, in fact, uh, our volunteers are under uh, what we call a volunteer uh, service agreement or volunteer in, uh, in park program. And uh, so technically when, when they're under a VIP program, they are treated and managed just like they were, to, uh, just as if they were paid staff. So if they were to go out and work as an example, uh, volunteer on the trail during the shutdown and then get hurt, uh, they wouldn't be able to receive workers, workman's compensation because uh, they would be working outside of their VIP program. So nobody's tending to the trail, but anybody could get on the trail. Yeah, unlike a Yosemite, a Yellowstone, where you've got, you know, some kind of a, either a natural border wall, if you will, for the, the park uh, or a fence with, uh, with entrance points, uh, the park uh, that, that I work at, the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, is a porous park. Uh, so technically, typically in most cases, there really aren't uh, entrance points. It's, it's just sort of park along the roadway and hop on a side trail and next thing you know, you're on the AT. Now the, the part, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the trail does go through several national parks and national forests. And so in some cases, there are some um, there are some natural entrance points that would be uh, indicative in those in those cases. Um, I was going to ask about uh, support for, for each other. Like, is there are how are you and your colleagues doing in terms of just connecting with each other and and um, because because you're home, right? My husband used to work for the government and, and he was part of the last shutdown, but he actually had to go to work so that he was going and not getting paid. And then they got a retro payment. But I understand you all are not. And so what is that like for you all? Yeah, as you mentioned, currently, we're not receiving paychecks. Um, the, uh, the staff, uh, we're actually not allowed to uh, use our government computers or mobile devices. So we're, we actually are staying in touch through Facebook <laughs> uh, and other means. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to be uh, reaching out to my staff and inviting them over for dinner here real soon, uh, probably this weekend, uh, just to get, get together and talk. And our, our superintendent, Wendy Jansen, has been really good about uh, weekly putting a call into each and every employee and uh, just seeing how they're doing. And uh, I, I can report in at least one case, one of the employees is for sure already put in for unemployment. Well, that's interesting. Now, didn't didn't they vote to reinstate pay with, um, for you? That has they, happened, correct? They did, yeah. Um, OPM uh, actually also just came out, uh, the, the Congress and, and the president to put a bill through uh, that stated that we will be back, back paid. But um, the, uh, the OPM also, um, I'm I was very pleased to see this because when the shutdown started, it was, as you may remember, just before Christmas. And like most people, a lot of us try to use our user leave, leave uh, during that time and, and be with our, our families. I had taken two weeks off, uh, planned leave, and then the shutdown happened. So they're going to be reinstating all of that leave. We'll get that back, uh, which was which was really nice uh, to hear. Yeah, that was good news because I had uh, friends who are still working that they were worried that wouldn't happen. So um, how, how are you all keeping your, I mean, it's good to hear you're connecting on Facebook and having folks over to your home. And um, what are other ways that you're coping and even for yourself spiritually, um, how are you coping with this? Yeah, it's the, that's the really hard part, uh, especially in the beginning, you know, that, that bill just got passed that I mentioned, uh, reinstating our, our pay when we get back to work. But uh, right at the beginning, you, we don't have that guarantee. So uh, you're, you know, you're financially, you're, you're really pinching pennies in places that you might not. Uh, and in the little community I live in, there's a lot of federal workers that work around here. We're about an hour outside of DC and there's lots of parks and uh, federal employment um, units around here. And so all the, all the local uh, restaurants and stores, uh, you know, all of them start to feel that, that, uh, that pinch as well. And I, you know, I've only gone out to, to eat a couple times. Uh, most of my, my meals have been at home. 
um, you know, we, we just, we've really been, we've really sort of hold, held back here at our, our household here for, for me getting by, uh, I'm a musician also. So getting together with friends, playing music, um, and, uh, and, and there's a couple of uh, park service Facebook sites. Um, that's always a good place to go and sort of see how other people are dealing and try to answer questions for there's some of those folks who are, who maybe haven't been in the, the park service long enough to go through one of these. Um, you know, I've, I've been going through these since uh, 1989. That's when I first started with the park service. I've, I've seen quite a few go um, back in 95. I, I remember uh, we lost uh, three staff members, um, seasonal staff who just, they couldn't wait it out. They had to go find employment elsewhere. And um, I don't think they've ever returned back to federal service. So it's been, it's been hard, uh, you know, just personally, um, emotionally, um, you know, just the, the not knowing the sitting around where we've all, we've all been told that, you know, we should be prepared to go back to work within 24 hours of the government reopening. So even if we wanted to, we couldn't really leave town. It's almost, I feel like I'm a prisoner uh, <laughs> to, uh, to my own home. And then the really sad bit is all we want to do is go back to work. You know, we, we all really believe in our mission statements, uh, no matter what unit or what service you might be in in the federal government. Uh, folks just want to go back to work. Yeah, you mentioned you live in a, in a place where a whole lot of people work for the government. So is there a sense of that the energy is different there? Um, I bet the commuter trains, for instance, are just empty. I mean, I, I'm just trying to picture what it's like. And I know some of our congregations in the area have have talked about how a, a large number of the folks going to church are affected, some of the Beltway area and outskirts of the Beltway. Yeah, you, you, I really hear it when I, when I am out and about. It, it's on everyone's minds. Uh, me and my wife were out uh, this last weekend and uh, you know, everybody's sitting around us. At one point or another, uh, that subject came up and people were talking about it. Some of them, um, you know, I, we, we engaged in a couple bits of conversation and some of it was, was very personal, uh, you know, stories that people had uh, about what they're going through. Uh, I, I, I've been lucky enough to, to be in a position where I, I've got a little bit of, you know, savings in the bank and I can get through for a little while. Uh, but uh, at some point it's, it's, it's going to become, uh, a, you know, I'm going to have to start making some of these very serious decisions that other, others are already having to make that are living paycheck to paycheck. And so many people in the, in the government, you know, we, we don't get into these positions to, to become rich. You know, we, we, we find something that we really love to do. Like I said, we, we really believe in our mission statements and, and we, we, we see the greater cause and good in, in what, we're, what we're doing. Um, so we don't make a lot of money and, and we know that going in. Uh, but what we do rely on is the stability uh, that the positions typically bring and uh, to have that combination of not making, say, as much money as you might in the private sector and then have the rug swept out underneath you uh, is pretty dam damaging for a lot of people out there right now. We have Liz Brewer-Martin writing in from Salt Lake saying her spouse is an essential federal employee and actually working overtime due to scheduled system testing. We're living on credit right now and it's incredibly stressful. I'm sure it is, Liz, thank you for writing. Yeah, it's, you know, I lived in DC for 10 years and especially the black middle class, so many of those folks own houses because of government jobs. And as you say, don't make a lot of money. And I, I worry about the impact on housing, say in the Beltway area for people who are, you know, not the upper level people, but the people who have the lower paying federal jobs, but, but have managed to get a house and, you know, because the, the market there has gone insane anyway. And so if you get out of it, you're gone, you're never going to get back in. So yeah, I've been thinking a lot about all my former neighbors in Washington, DC, and I'm sure my old neighborhood feels a lot like you're describing your town, Keith. Thanks for coming and telling us about it. And just to say, we're, we're lifting up all of the affected people and, and the parks themselves. I was reading about the Joshua Tree Monument, people cutting some endangered trees down and 
which why they would do that anyway, you just think what's wrong with you. But, you know, just there's so little respect for the land anyway. And then to take away the very minimal skeletal staffing that's being provided is really demoralizing. Yeah, o over the past few years, uh, the, uh, the Park Service uh, nationwide has really seen a, an incredible increase in visitation. Uh, my own park, and I think over the past five years, each year has seen about a 25% increase. That's over 25% in five years. It, it's, it, if, you, if you combine that with now not having the parks staffed, and, and we were already at a place where we've had the lowest staffing we've had in years. So this rise in visitation, the, the, the rock bottom staffing that we have uh, throughout the park service, and now this shutdown on top of that, uh, we, we've got, we've got a, a multi-billion dollar backlog and deferred maintenance. Uh, that story I think has been, uh, been well covered um, on the news. Uh, you, if you put these things together, it's a, it's a bit of a perfect storm for the National Park Service at this point. Um, and uh, it, it just, it's, it's very, very difficult, again, for those of us who really believe in the mission statement and, uh, and want to preserve and protect and offer, um, you know, access to these wonderful places that we have. And with an administration that would like to privatize them all anyway. Yeah, it's, yes. it's a perfect storm as you described. Well, thanks so much for visiting and telling us about that. And we may wanna check back in with you sadly, if this continues and kind of, you know, stay in touch and, and Liz and others who are affected by this, we'd love to hear from you too. And, Great, well, yeah. I, I'd love to talk more. Fingers crossed we won't have to, at least about Fingers this. Fingers crossed, that's yes. right. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm glad you have the music. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we have a double header today. We're talking about the government shutdown, a shutdown we don't like. And then we're talking about a shutdown we do like, a shutdown of one of the detention centers, or let's just call them what they are, concentration camps for children, um, uh, immigrant children in the United States. And Dottie Matthews and Rabbi Bruce Elder have, Reverend Dottie Matthews and Rabbi Bruce Elder have been involved in this struggle. Dottie is an affiliated community minister from Columbia, Missouri, and Rabbi Bruce leads Congregation Hakafa in Glencoe, Illinois. I hope I said that right. <laughs> I'm always open to being told that I didn't. So I got it. Good enough. Okay. So let's hear um, from you all. Um, Dottie, let's start with you. How did you get involved with this? And, and tell us a little bit about your story how you came into this. Yeah, I'm really glad to do that. And I, I can't help but as I was listening to Keith and imagining all the damage to our environment and the damage to people's lives, that the reason for this shutdown is very much the reason that Bruce and I and so many others, you know, trying to, this wall is another version of inflicting suffering on people whose crime is to try to acquire for themselves a viable way of life. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it just, the senselessness and the waste is, is beyond comprehension. Um, the way that I got involved in this is that I retired in 2015. I had had an active ministry in both the parish and in, uh, as a chaplain and, um, thought that I was kind of going to sit back on my laurels and have, um, lots of bike riding and trail time. And, um, and then the election happened in 2016, and I was invited to work with immigrants in mid-Missouri to uh, accompany them as they go for their ICE and uh, ISAP check-ins in St. Louis and Kansas City. And so I got deeply involved in that whole process, and um, then just, just immigrant justice in general kind of became the, the dominant part of my uh, social justice work. And then uh, Surge called and asked me to be part of their uh, asylum seeking program. So I'm working with them, helping matching, finding people who are willing to be sponsors for asylees. Can and getting, Surges? Sure, I'm sorry, showing up for racial justice, uh, S U R J. And um, 
And then I was on a group call, one of many, many group calls, and I heard um, that there was a pilgrimage happening from um, a bunch of very cool rabbis that were putting together a pilgrimage to go down to Torneo and respond to the suffering of those children and, and um, the absolute senseless um, incarceration of those kids. And um, I hopped on with uh, Bruce and Josh Winston and a few other people. And um, through that, Bruce and I have formed a collaboration with a ton of other people. I liked your term about collaborative leadership because I think we're getting to live that very much with the Shut Torneo Down Coalition. And um, so between the asylum seeking sponsorship program and the Shut Torneo Down and where we go at now that Torneo is shut down, um, those are the things that are my driving life passions right now. And, um, and fortunately, I'm meeting a ton of very cool people who um, share the same passion that I do and are willing to work countless hours to relieve the suffering of these innocent folks. Thanks, Johnny. Bruce, can you talk a little bit about uh, the Jewish movement around immigration? It's, it's a very compelling theological and um, spiritual conversation going on, I see among rabbis and among Jewish people about, about supporting immigrants. Uh, yeah, first, uh, thank you for the invitation to come and be part of this. I am uh, touched and honored. Uh, I used to say that um, if you want to know where to go for social justice, follow the nuns. I have now changed that to say follow the nuns and the Unitarians. Um, to be able to be in relationship with such an incredibly dynamic group of people has been a gift and an honor. So thank you for allowing me to participate in this as well. Um, and it's been, uh, Dottie's one of my new best friends. So um, it's really, it's a gift uh, to be with you, Dottie. Um, I have been incredibly uh, touched and warmed as well to see how strong the Jewish community across the United States has been showing up in important spaces really since the inauguration and the attempt to um, scapegoat Muslims through the Muslim ban that took place in 2016. Um, and we have been very well represented in these places, I think for a couple of reasons, uh, Meg. Uh, for one is our recent history, right? Um, not just from the Holocaust, uh, but from uh, 120 years ago, our attempts to leave the Pale of Settlement in Russia and to find a better place here, and the realization that the abilities that were given to us as a people should not be limited to us, and uh, we know what it takes to get here, and therefore we need to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Uh, but also because of our rich textual history, which has been telling us um, in the Torah, there are 613 commandments. 36 of them are one, which says, you shall not oppress the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And to actually be given the opportunity to live that um, brings the Jewish community to a really unique place in which we've gained enough power in the society to realize that we have to use it effectively and compassionately and meaningfully in relationship to people most affected by it. Um, to see that as a Jewish responsibility to do so and to act on it, we're in a period of time in which uh, the Jewish community is doing just that. So this was a pilgrimage led by rabbis? Is that what Dottie said? Uh, the initial rally, uh, yes. We jumped on a little bit after it was starting to be planned as well. We being congregation Hakafa. Um, a little background, if I might just really, you said it fine, Meg. Half the people in the congregation say Hakafa. Hakafa, just you guys, works just fine. Um, my personal story um, was that my father is a Holocaust, was a Holocaust survivor. As a 14-year-old, he was in Auschwitz and Dachau and watched his mother and sister go to the gas chambers. And so I've always had a personal sensitivity to issues of children imprisonment and collective imprisonment and oppression. I'm not suggesting for a moment that Tornillo was Auschwitz or Dachau, but when uh, we saw during the Kavanaugh, hear Kavanaugh hearings that it was being expanded from a 380 bed facility to a 3,800 bed facility, and there was an attempt to make it uh, permanent and an example to be used in other places, a prototype, we in our congregation knew we had to get down there and to jump on board. 
The only way we would do that is if there are already people on the ground doing the work that we can support. So we're not a bunch of people jumping down there saying, ah, and then leaving. It had to be an effective on the ground uh, effort that we were supporting. And so we actually went down earlier than when the rally happened in November. And in the process, we found out that this pilgrimage that was really uh, started by Rabbi Josh Winston out of Ann Arbor, who was also incensed, and some friends that he had called, got us together to say, let's make this happen. And we at Hakafad jumped on only with the understanding that it was to be a step in a process and not the end result itself. And so we had the honor of participating in the coordinating of it and to continuing with the facilitation of the coalition since. So let's talk about how it got shut down. That's why I wanted to do this because it, it was a success. So what do, what do you think were the steps that made it actually get shut down and did it just get moved somewhere or did, did something really change? Dottie, please. Sure, well, um, the 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 way it got shut down i think that we would agree that um light was shined upon it and it was set up in kind of this subterfuge sort of manner where it was out in the desert it was not visible um the expansion was not widely known but um there happened to be one man who is jewish uh from new york right right bruce yes who who took this on so the concern of it so personally that months ago he took an RV and drove down there and parked outside of Tornillo and monitored who was going in and who was going out and how many kids were happening there and what how many buildings were going up and he um, held up signs saying free our children and um, encouraging the workers to use their conscience to think about what it was they were doing there and um, it was through this one person that the attention started getting drawn there. And then pilgrimages like ours and the group from Hakafa that went down and, and others, uh, this rolling sense of, of uh, absolute outrage of what they were doing to these innocent children, most of whom, as we can tell now, most of whom had family waiting for them. The vast majority of these kids had family waiting for them but our government had imposed such absurd restrictions that they chose to put them into these internment camps rather than release them to their waiting loved ones. And so just by, by drawing attention to um, the fact that the existence of this camp, its rapid expansion, um, the um, uh, treatment of the children, how they were being neglected, uh, not having education, not having medical care, not having psychological care. They were, they were having the very minimal basic, they had clothes, they weren't freezing to death, but they were playing soccer all day long instead of actually being nurtured in any way. Um, and so I think we were a part of a chain of awareness that drew that made the people who were running it, and particularly BCFS, which um, that's the name that they are called now. They were running the camp, managing it. They didn't build it, but they were managing it and providing the workers. And that, is that a private company? I don't know what that is. BC. Yeah, I was going to explain. I should thanks. It's um, BCFS was Baptist Child and Family Services. It's a nonprofit, and um, they. Uh, We've part of our group has been investigating, following the money on all of this, and they're they may be a nonprofit, but their revenues have certainly skyrocketed since they got into this business, and um, so just trying to reach out to those people and and call them. BCFS particularly had stated values about caring for the vulnerable in our society, and. Um, so we and, and many other people have just been drawing attention to what they were doing there. And um, I think that that putting them into a light made them realize that we don't really want to do this. So Kevin Denon um, is the CEO and he's the one who recently terminated that contract. Um, and now he's saying that, you know, he didn't really want to take it to the levels that it got, but whatever, he did oversee it as it was, it is, as it did get to that level. And um, 
So now it's it's not a one time deal. We were just on a conference call last night. Uh, Bruce has been really magnificent in helping keep us corralled and focused. And you know, what are our meaningful next steps? Where do we go from this? Because even though the vast majority of the kids got released to loved ones, some of them went other places. We don't know exactly where. We it's part of our. We, many of us want to track that, and um, also people want to. Uh, what's what's our next if there's there's BCFS there's Southwest Key a similar organization also a purported nonprofit also a company whose profit whose revenues have um, skyrocketed through this uh, there's Homestead in Florida so we've got people who are working on a whole variety of ways of shining light instead of just letting this be a hidden um, torture for these innocent people and Bruce you want to add to that uh, the only thing that I'll add is it was our intention all along to, to support the efforts on the ground and also work towards, as Dottie said in our meeting last night, to end immigrant detention. And we see that children detention is one aspect of that, that actually immigrant detention is one aspect of a greater issue that we need to be chipping away at. And that is immigration reform that makes sense, that's compassionate, that's fair, and that's just. And um, so the fact that we currently have uh, 10,500 children across the country being detained, which is just a fraction of the tens of thousands of immigrants that are being detained for the, as Dottie alluded to earlier, the quote unquote crime of seeking asylum in our country. The absurdity that we've gotten to the point of calling claiming asylum a crime um, is just baffling. So we always understood that this, um, I hate to say fight because I don't using, like using violent images, but I'll call it that, that this fight um, has many steps, many touch points, and that we have a responsibility to address them uh, strategically as possible um, is kind of how we are continuing. It's a ragtag group of about 100 people. Um, the strategy developed pretty quickly after our November uh, event in which we started talking to legislators. We started talking to national immigrant um, advocates so that we don't step on toes, so that we support their efforts and so that we are filling in uh, niches that need to be filled and we continue to do that. Um, we spoke to a member of Congress pretty early on. We presented demands that were worked on with us and the National Immigration Justice Coalition uh, Center and with Hope Border Institute in El Paso. Um, she thought that what we had put together was great and asked us to get national sign on. This was the beginning of December. Within two weeks, we had 60,000 people and 200 organizations, local and national, that had signed onto it, which blew everyone's mind, including ours, um, to show how sensitive and how important this issue is. And that is coalescing around a DC strategy and these other local strategies as well. Are you allowed to visit the children? No, no. And part of this is in none of these facilities, particularly Homestead and Tornillo, which are in a separate category. Um, no one was allowed in unless there was a special guided tour. Anyone who works in these facilities have not been allowed to share information with people on the outside. And there's been absolutely no government oversight whatsoever, especially in these emergency shelters. The, if I may for a moment, the Trump administration was trying to find a way to circumvent uh, federal law around this. In the 1990s, I believe it was, the Flores Agreement stated that people can be held for 72 hours to be processed before um, going uh, being sent off to their sponsors up to 20 days. Uh, the Obama administration took that to mean we can keep people up to 20 days. Uh, the Trump administration has tried to say how can we avoid that altogether? So they are trying to set up these various temporary centers on federal land to say that as temporary shelters, they are not uh, beholden to these legal strictures. And there's a lot of legal challenges around that. So the two principal places that that was taking place were at Homestead in Florida and in Tornillo in Texas, and Tornillo being the most egregious. Um, so we went after that for that, uh, for that reason. Um, so no, you cannot uh, get into any of these. It's very difficult to do so. However, um, there were, uh, there's two, um, there was a GAO report, um, government, um, government accounting 
you know, the, where they audited BCFS and found multiple violations of things like um, not uh, doing background checks on people that were in charge of these kids. Yes. Um, and uh, the whole variety of failing to provide the medical care, failing to provide dental care, failing to provide all the things that should be any in any facility that um, is caring for children. And then um, Southwest Key has had... Um, uh, is Southwest Key a place or a company? It's or? a company, it's another nonprofit. Okay. It's like BCFS, but it's another nonprofit. Um, they do uh, children criminal things too, um, you know, uh, supposedly rehabilitative things for, for young people. But in their detention centers, they've also been cited for brutality against the children. That, I don't know if you all saw, but there was a recent video that circulated on Facebook of a guard dragging a child and um, multiple things like that. And those were Southwest Key facilities. So um, yes, they, they do a lot to hide from the public eye, but people are trying to get in. And when um, authorities that are charged with protecting children get in, they find, they write reports that show this is uh, very unhealthy for these kids. I saw a report about a shocking number of deaths that have taken place of children. I can't remember, but it was hundreds. I mean, it was not a small number of kids who have died in these centers. Have you seen that? I, I just saw it I go by not. once. Yeah, I, I saw, I saw um, that, that I knew that there were three very publicized cases of children dying. Um, the, the hundreds I thought were adults that had died, oh, um, that but I could that I got it wrong. I, yeah, I, I could easily imagine so that horrible that, you know, I, I mean, congratulations for going into it. I, for, it is the stuff of many of my nightmares and, um, I, I wonder how it affects you spiritually to go in rather than to just be numb and horrified and go some of the other directions that many of us do. Does it, it must be traumatic, but also help in some way. I'm curious spiritually for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Bruce, I'll be interested to hear your answer as well. Um, for me, this work has so focused my spiritual life and what I'm, what I'm about every morning when I wake up that um, it's really um, invigorated uh, me. And it's, it's, yes, I, I cry readily. <laughs> Um, often I cry. Um, I, I just recently I was in the El Paso airport. I flew out to California to see my grandkids and I saw a bunch of kids being released from Tornillo in the airport. They were, they filed off the plane and just seeing these teenagers, one young man especially was holding a teddy bear and they were, they waited silently. Obviously they'd been, they knew very deeply how to line up and how to be silent as so it was about a hundred teenagers and they, um, lined up in 10 rows of 10, just like quickly and didn't say a word. And then the agent was calling out their names one after the other as they went to get their connecting flight tickets. But, you know, my heart broke and I just sat there with tears in my eyes, weeping over what, what kinds of lives are these kids going to go into as far as now they begin their healing process. I hope they're going to families that love them and will understand what they've been through. And, but their families that they're returning to are probably dealing with their own traumas. And um, one of the calls that I was on talked about our government. People say that our, this system is a broken immigration system. And uh, one uh, astute person corrected that speaker and said, no, it's not broken. This is exactly what the government intends to do. This is, and, and this person's phrase, which just struck terror in my heart, but I believe is true, is our government's current policy is to intentionally inflict intergenerational trauma and they are having wide success at that. And so if the efforts that I and Bruce and all the hundreds and thousands of people that are doing this kind of work, if we can mitigate that just a little bit, um, I feel like, okay. And, and then we got the bonus of actually seeing Tornillo shut down. A lot of people do this kind of work forever and they don't get to see um, the tents collapse, but, um, we, we took a moment to celebrate that, and now we're on to the next thing because there's so much more to be done. Uh, what I can add to that, and then Meg, if you'd like, uh, I can also speak to exactly who are we talking about when we talk about the children, because I saw that there was a question there. Um, and it feeds into what Dottie was talking about, about this administration's policy. 
What has been most spiritually uplifting for me, and it really has been, is that for two years, uh, personally, I have felt um, every day a little more crushed as we see the abject cruelty and intentional cruelty against all of the norms and people that make this country what it is. And, and, and you get to these, I have gotten to these low points of, I just don't know what to do. It just hurts too much. It's beyond numbing. And to be involved in this, with this group, um, not just at Tornillo, but actually the group of people, the group of Dotties um, that are out there, um, which are just a microcosm of the people in this country that care so passionately. And just because they know it's the right thing to do and can are stepping up. We contributed to shutting this camp down in six weeks, which is a lot of luck and a lot of help from somewhere. And, and to see that people are so incredibly thoughtful and kind and committed has, has elevated my spirit and given me a sense of, oh my God, we are as good as we know we can be. And that what's going on in this, this oppression and suppression and repression and destruction of our values in DC, and people are standing up for that, are not only what makes this country, that the vast majority are so much more. And to be driven and um, uplifted by that is what's been moving me for the past weeks. Uh, keeping me up at night, but also um, uh, continuing to insist that I am part of that uh, because we all need to be. Yeah, and we yeah. have to be real that this country has always inflicted multi-generational trauma on black and brown yeah. people. I, as yeah. you've talked, I've thought about my visit to Angel Island, which is where our immigration system started with all the imprisoned Chinese people who tried to come for asylum and were basically locked up for years and wrote poetry on the walls and were sent home again. And that's where the immigration policies came from, was from keeping Chinese people out in very, very cruel and very specific and, and designed ways. And, you know, it continues. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> then there were all the people who were there to begin with, you know, I mean, so yeah, it's, this country is, there's the best of who we are and the worst of who we are has always been, I'm just reading a book now about the cotton industry and the cruelty involved in slavery. It is who foundationally this country was founded by. And it's all, here, we are. here we are all together. If I can add to that, Meg, is that uh, this existential question of where our country's going has been what's been playing out for the past couple of years. Do we want to continue uh, in that vein and be that, or do we want to be more than that? And over the past couple of years, feeling like, oh my God, our country wants to continue that way has been too much to bear. And to see that, no, it's not that way, um, has been incredibly important. One of the interesting conversations we've been having in the coalition and continue to have is the place of Brown and, and voices of color in this work and driving that work. And we are hoping that we are making those connections and hearing those voices and elevating them to the extent that we can. And there's been some tension around that um, through these questions of privilege and we are having those conversations as well. 100% right, our country's founded on that. The question is, is do we want it to be that way moving forward? I'm yeah. happy with a group of people that are telling me no and thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, think often about um, in seminary when we first entered, they told us that you know we were going to deconstruct our personal theology and then reconstruct it in a much more real way. And whatever you thought you believed when you entered, you're probably going to have a whole different relationship with those beliefs when you leave. And that was very true for me. Um, and I feel like our country is is deconstructing the view that we have of ourselves, that 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 the, we who are white have had the privilege of viewing up for ourselves, that that we were somehow um, concerned with justice for all, you know, all the phrases that are part of our songs and our pledges and all of that. Um, but I think the last few years have proved to us very clearly the, the, that there isn't even a facade of that. But as Bruce said, it doesn't need to stay that way. We could actually, actually begin to together to live into the things that we say we believe in. And um, we haven't visit, we haven't seen it at all yet. In fact, we've seen so much evidence of to the contrary 
but I think that a lot of us are waking up to that and willing, as you said, to, to look to the people who are affected by these things and say, instead of let us fix this, saying, how can we um, work with you? Tell us what where we go from here. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that it, for me, fundamentally, that's where hope comes from is, is the leadership of people of color, which has not been honored or, or that's at least my last hope, because I feel like uh, I have been a social white social justice activist my whole life. I'm on the brink of retirement, Dottie. And under my watch, the prison industrial complex has got, you know, I can people, white people can say I wasn't here for slavery, but I sure have been here since the prison industrial complex has enslaved so many people here. And so, so many things, it's like the best of times and the worst of times, but that is right. That's what liberation movements are always on the edge of the beast. So mm -hmm. I, I am, um, I think that is where hope is to be found is in the resistance. Yes. Um, so I'm, you know, the, you all are giving me hope and also a little bit of prodding that I should, I'm way more past. I'm, I have been, truly I've been immobilized on this one because I, my call to ministry was with abused kids. I know abused kids very, very well. I was an abused kid. So, you know, it's like, um, I think, a, I, I do think that this is inflicting trauma yeah. on many, many people. Psychologists that I know say that they're doing all kinds of counseling around the bullying and everything that's going on so visibly now. It's, it's, it's you know, nobody can say it's, no, it's not happening because it's visible. All the junk is coming to the top that's always happened, but people, right. white people have had the privilege not to see it. Right, and I, you know, the prison industrial complex is the same complex. Even the same companies are involved at the top. Uh, part of our investigation has been looking at GEO um, which is they build a ton of the prisons. They also build a ton of these detention facilities. Um, just, you know, a point of uh, in August of 2016, the Obama administration signed an order to end private detention centers. The very next day, GEO made a huge campaign donation to Trump and um, followed it up with more. And um, you know, then that that got pulled off the table. Obviously, those have stopped. But family separation, you know, we know for people in color, all the the people of color that are incarcerated, and their children have had to deal with life without their parents, uh, especially their dads. Um, this has been going on forever, and it's the same. It, it, that's why I think a lot of immigrant justice workers think we ought to be joining up with the prison reform people because it's the same core issue. It's the very same core issue as trying to get people of color out of sight and out of power uh, and take away any tiny bit of power they do have. I, I think it's important to uh, the prison industrial complex blew up under Clinton. The yeah. Democratic presidents haven't helped any of this. So, so this no. binary bullshit system we have is what you know, we need to get away from and realize is not going to be fixed by this fantasy of we just have to get the right white woman to be president. No offense to white women, but let's cut that shit out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't in any way disagree with you. Yes. That's part. This has gone on under every single president, every single like this incarceration stuff is nothing new. Um, and yet I think it has been hidden and and it isn't right now. And so that's what we need to keep um, putting the spotlight on and expanding the people that know. So did you work with media? Did you, uh, it sounds like a, you're a bunch of volunteers. Is, was there a media component to shining the light, as you said? Um, and how did that work? Because it, it seems like right now, the media is pretty willing to cover stuff that they haven't been willing to cover for a while too. It, the thing, places like, the New York Times and the Washington Post are more willing um, to talk. Yeah, Bruce, I'll let you talk about that. We did have coordinated press releases for the pilgrimage part that I was in. But Bruce, you want to talk about the, the wider picture? Well, I would say that we, we, uh, definitely that was a coordinated effort. It was a compelling story. And there were a couple of journalists that were embedded on that November 15th uh, that week. Um, but also people were taking notice of Josh Winston. I mean, Josh Rubin, who was the gentleman outside of the camp. And more and more press started coming and started digging. Uh, UPI, AP, uh, Washington Post, Reuters, a few others 
And it was a perfect storm. Uh, at the same time, Senator Merkley, Representative Chu and others were taking notice and they brought press with it. So there was just a real swirl around the media covering it, and it continues to cover. Just this week, uh, CBS did something earlier in the week about uh, Josh Rubin and the camp and the issues behind it, more than one, one piece. And we're seeing every couple of days more and more. And uh, to Josh Rubin's credit, he's been trying very hard to steer the conversation around, uh, away from white centering male coming from Brooklyn and focusing it on the issues, the children and uh, people of color, because uh, that's really key. It's an easy story to talk about Josh, um, and potentially damaging because it just reinforces a lot of the things we've just been talking about. Um, so we now have strong relationships with a lot of the media as we move forward and find the best way to get that message out. And the press is really important. You know, the, the whole family separation thing, the way that that broke, I don't know if you all remember, but there was, I think it was an NPR reporter that got in and recorded the screams of a baby being torn from his mother's arms. And people heard that baby crying and that was what got this. And so, as Bruce said early on, our ultimate goal is to end all detention. But we know that talking about kids, 13 to 17, innocent kids with family members waiting, um, it gets a lot more people alerted and willing to put themselves on the line to do something. Um, but the story is so much bigger than that. And it includes all the things that we've been talking about, we know. Yeah, but you have to, you have to do bite-sized pieces. So is there a particular, is Homestead the next um, focus or is there, uh, what, do you have a sense of that yet or too many focuses? Uh, so, yeah, so we're the victims of our own success, right? Um, it happened a lot sooner than we expected, and thankfully it did, and we know that there's a lot more to be done. There's going to be a conversation early next week to talk about just that. Um, I can't say uh, where we're going to end up because it has to be part of the group, uh, the democratic process. It would seem that if not Homestead, then Brownsville, Texas, that has the most beds in it, uh, currently of kids, uh, over 1,500 beds, if not more. Uh, Homestead just uh, increased its capacity to over 2,300, but it only has like 1,300 in it right, only has 1,300 in it right now. Um, so where can we, the questions we have to answer is, are a few. One is where is there already work being done on the ground? Two, um, where, what is our ultimate goal and what's the best way to get there? Um, and there's a few others as well. So we're looking at that in the next couple of days, we'll know. Uh, it might be that we go to more than one place. We just can't spread ourselves too thin. And I, uh, we also have a, you know, we did a clergy letter to BCFS. We're doing another clergy letter right now to Southwest Key, to the individual board members. Um, and we're, we're, you know, I, they, I think we probably won't have the privilege of folk narrowly focusing. We've got legislative people. We've got on the ground in El Paso people. We've got... Um, but the thing is just trying to stay active and trying to keep communication clear. I really have to give gratitude to a lot of people, but Bruce is one of them, who are helping us um, not get lost in the weeds of this or in any kind of self-aggrandizement for any person. This is uh, what are the people on the ground telling us they need and how can we be behind them to help them get done what they need to get done. We are having a, a, a big event the first week of February uh, in D.C. There are bills that were introduced in the last, legislature, last uh, legislative uh, congressional session that will be reintroduced. We're trying to time a major um, event in D.C. to that, which looks like the first week in February, in which we're going to ask for co-sponsors and hopefully visit every office to demand some kind of participation in this. So if anybody who's listening to this uh, wants to be involved and engaged, please email shuttornillodown at gmail.com and we'll get uh, in touch with you quickly. Again, shut Tornillo down. Tornillo is T-O-R-N-I-L-L-O. -L -L uh, shut, shut Tornillo down at gmail.com and we will uh, engage you. And I'm sure you know, there's so many religious organizers in DC that will be thrilled to be part of this. They're, they're the different denominational groups and also some good interfaith ones, mm -hmm. says the former DC person. <laughs> but yeah, I hope, I hope you're roping in faith in public life for some 
media help. They're good at that backup media help. We will now. Yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you so much. And thanks for your work and your calls and, and your humanity. Next week, we're going to have Paul Ortiz coming on to talk about his Beacon book, the African-American and Latinx history of the U.S. And we can talk some about the use of the word Latinx, which lately I've been hearing is U.S.-centered and oppressive. So that will be a good, good start for that and always something to learn from the guests. Aisha, I hope you feel better. Dottie and Bruce, thank you so much. And Jessica, next week when we see you, I don't know. We have a halo. Will you be wearing a clerical collar? <laughs> I'll just be levitating. It's all right. You won't be able to tell because but. it'll say Reverend Jessica on it, huh? There we go. Oh, no, even better. Reverend Star Rockers. <laughs> clergy name ever. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very Thank you much. All. I, I, I really feel grateful to have been part of this.